Okay, let me um, begin by voicing my agreement with uh, Oscar Morgenstern, uh, who in a 1972 Kyklos um, article said the following, economic theory is unending because we are confronted with an open system. The idea that we could have a closed system of economic theory, say of the Valrasian type, is a futile one, end quote. So I think it's important to recognize that much of what I'm going to say mirrors my conception of what the economic system is like. If the economic system is truly open, then I think our economic theory is going to have to be open. It's going to have to reflect that. This, is in, this philosophy, I think, is in sharp contrast with what I will call uh, the quote-unquote comfort school of Austrian economics. Now, the comfort school believes that all basic propositions of economics have been solved and that Austrians are in possession of the whole truth and nothing but the truth, and that our only mission is to spread the word. Now, uh, this comfort school and my uh, view of what Austrian economics are, is all about are not uh, compatible. Um, in discussing uh, a better concept of coordination, I obviously believe that some really basic work still needs to be done in economic theory. Let me say at the outset uh, that the better concept is one that portrays coordination as imperfect, uh, as plans which do not mesh completely, arising from an incompletely specified process. In other words, I, I, uh, I'm elevating to a, a level of almost principle here uh, the virtues of uh, a certain degree of vagueness. Why do we need a new, perhaps uh, uh, looser concept of coordination or equilibrium. Uh, we need it because we need, first, a concept of coordination that makes sense as an idealized or ideal typical result of a process. It does not make sense to use a concept of equilibrium that is inconsistent with our characterization of the dynamic process that generates it. And this is a point which uh, Jerry and I made in, in our book. But earlier than our book, uh, in 1977, uh, Malenvo justified the same claim in a different way. He said, to rely on a general equilibrium formalization is to accept a shortcut. That is, the consideration of only those equilibrium states that would result from dynamic adjustments, end quote. So the idea that Malenvo uh, uh, proposes is, is different than ours, but nevertheless, I think, compatible. If we're going to deal with equilibrium theory at all, then we ought to deal with equilibrium theory in a way that pays uh, its respect to the fact that equilibria are generated by processes. So we shouldn't talk really about equilibria that no conceivable process could ever generate. The second reason that we need a, uh, a new concept or a better concept of equilibrium uh, is that we need a concept that makes learning processes possible in a way that the concept of disequilibrium cannot. Austrians often say that disequilibrium, in a certain sense, generates learning. But I think that's not quite right, because disequilibrium does not have enough structure or order for learning to take place. In other words, what I'm claiming is that learning can only take place with an intermediate degree of order. So dichotomizing the world into equilibrium and disequilibrium doesn't take account of the fact that the so-called disequilibrium that's supposed to generate this learning must itself have a certain amount of order, a certain amount of structure in order to generate the, uh, the learning that is requisite. So for these two reasons, I think we need a better concept of coordination. Now let me throw light on each one of these reasons by referring to some previous theoretical uh, developments which I think are consistent uh, with the ideas that I'm trying to uh, elaborate here. The first, again, equilibrium as an idealized outcome of a process. Now this has roots in uh, some of the work of Hayek, uh, but let me first start out by showing the way in which Hayek uh, argues for 
a concept of exact coordination, that is to say a concept which is at variance to the uh, looser, or at variance with the looser concept of coordination that I'm trying to promote. The idea of exact coordination, that is to say the idea that there's perfect coordination of plans, requires, I think, a rigid distinction between equilibrating and disequilibrating movements. Because only then can we freeze the disequilibrating, disequilibrating shocks and allow, at least notionally, for complete adjustment. So the idea is that we have a shock, a disequilibrating movement, right? and that once we had that shock, we can take it as a separate factor, separate from what comes next, namely the adjustment, the equilibrating adjustment to that disequilibrating shock and allow then for all of the equilibration to take place, resulting in a perfect uh, adjustment, a perfect coordination. Now, as you can see, the analysis requires that on the one hand, we can say this is disequilibrating, and on the other hand, this is equilibrating, and the two concepts don't get mixed together. There isn't any question of ambiguity of one uh, or the other. So it requires uh, this idea of exact coordination as a useful analytical tool requires the, uh, the, the, rec the cooperating idea of the complete separation of equilibrating from disequilibrating movements. Now, Hayek clearly recognized that disequilibrating shocks would continually uh, occur. But as we saw, he carefully segregated disequilibrating shocks from equilibrating adjustments. In uh, his article, Competition as a Discovery Procedure, Hayek calls discovery what is essentially discovery of adaptive means. That is to say, discovery of equilibrating adjustments. And he uses the word discovery only in that context. And anything else, in other words, any other kinds of discovery in the colloquial use of the word, are called, quote unquote, unforeseen change. And that's very interesting because I think that uh, Kersner follows that same tradition. For Kersner, what is dis Kersner has uh, used the word discovery countless times. And sometimes you think he's getting at the idea of a completely open system in the way that I would mean, in the way that a number of other people would mean. Uh, but it becomes very clear that what he means is what, really what Hayek meant. Discovery is discovery of adaptive means. Discovery is discovery of equilibrating adjustments. And uh, it, is, uh, it is rooted in a, a, a use of the term, term that Hayek, uh, I think, initiated. But I think it's illegitimate to separate these two kinds of change. And the reason for that can be found in Hayek's work itself. And this is, exhibits a certain tension in Hayek. In Economics and Knowledge, which is earlier than Competition and Discovery Procedure, Hayek says the following. Quote, the tendency toward equilibrium is only toward an equilibrium relative to that knowledge which people will acquire in the course of their economic activity. Relative to that knowledge which people will acquire in the course of their economic activity, end quote. Now, what is going to cause people to acquire knowledge in the course of their economic activity? Well, one thing that Professor Kersner has emphasized very much in his work is the attraction or the lure of profit opportunities. Profit opportunities will cause us to make discoveries, but these discoveries, I suggest, uh, will disrupt any implicit equilibrium toward which the system might move. Just as an existing technology may, might be disseminated by this discovery procedure, by the lure of profit opportunities. And this, of course, is what one of the things that Hayek and, and, and Kersner have in mind, that there may be knowledge of a technology that somebody has somewhere in the system, and that gets disseminated by the fact that other actors in the system want to uh, uh, make profits. But at the same time, as this dissemination discovery takes place, it's also the case that the very lure of profit opportunities will cause people to discover entirely new technologies that nobody in the system knows. And these are, by definition, disruptive of any implicit equilibrium toward which the system might be at any point in time moving. Now, this distinction between uh, in, um, 
what I would call dissemination discovery and, and truly originative discovery, uh, has also been made by Ulrich Witt in his own work uh, using another terminology. Moreover, uh, Franklin Fisher, uh, in a 1982 book called Disequilibrium Foundations of Equilibrium Economics, saw something of the same problem. But his, his perspective was a little different, or well, perhaps a lot different, but still he saw the same, the same problem. He says the following uh, in a, uh, uh, I think it's a footnote, but I'm not sure. In an ongoing economy, what constitutes an exogenous shock, he asks. How is such an ex original shock to be distinguished from the endogenous shock brought about by adjustment to the original shock, end quote. Uh, uses the word shock a little too often here. Uh, but basically what he's arguing is two things. One is you're dealing with a chain of interconnected events. Right? You have uh, an exogenous shock and then you have adjustments, but they're really, in a basic sense, interconnected. So separating them out is, is a bit artificial. But secondly, the very idea of an adjustment could be looked at as a shock to the system because people don't expect those adjustments. You know, in, in competition as a discovery procedure, Hayek makes the uh, entirely valid and very important point that if we knew the outcome of competition. We wouldn't need competition in the first place. In our chapter, whatever it was, uh, cool, on competition. <laughs> uh, well, I don't remember the numbers of the chapter. Was chapter six, maybe? I don't know. Um, uh, we make the point, this very point, starting out with this example about a sports game and all of that. I mean, why would you need to play the game if you knew the outcome to begin with, right? And also, the idea is that if you knew that the results of competition, why would you need it in the first place? Precisely because you don't know the results. Well, part of the results of competition are the adjustments that are going to take place to these exogenous shocks. If you knew what the adjustments were going to be in the first place, right, you wouldn't need the method of competition to arrive at the best adjustments. So that these adjustments are necessarily a surprise to many people within the system. And as, as, a surpri as surprises, they are shocking. I mean, if we want to use that terminology, right? They are shocking just as much as the change in tastes, which is considered the, you know, the change in the data. The exogenous shock is shocking. So that adjustments are every bit as much a shock to people as original shocks to the system. Uh, exogenous shocks, the changes in the data uh, are. And the only reason that people don't generally recognize this The only reason that people don't generally recognize this, I think, is because in neoclassical economics, the idea that adjustment might be, have surprising elements, uh, that adjustment might not be something which could be known before a process takes place, doesn't really figure in very well. Because first of all, there aren't any processes most of the time. And, uh, and secondly, because there isn't a conception that competition discovers anything really new. Now, there are always exceptions to my generalizations about neoclassical economics. And it's interesting, in, uh, back, even back in 85 when we wrote our book, I think there's a chapter somewhere in which it said that uh, one of the difficulties in arguing against neoclassical economics is it's so spongy, it's so it's so flexible that almost anything is going to have some exceptions, any generalization. Um, but nevertheless, I think that's still the basic idea inherent in neoclassical economics is that adjustment isn't anything, isn't much of a surprise. Uh, and therefore, the distinction between exogenous and endogenous can proceed extremely uh, rigidly most of the time. Now, Hayek, um, <clears throat> as I say, did understand this feature of competition and that competition discovers things that otherwise people don't know. But of course that's at variance with his view that you can keep a strict separation between exogenous and endogenous. But there are other ways in which Hayek sees that the loosening of a concept of coordination is important. In the very same article, Competition as a Discovery Procedure, he developed a concept of order, it's his words, his word, order. 
which, quote, can be preserved throughout a process of change, end quote. Now, this looser concept of coordination uh, came out of a recognition that adjustment processes involve the disappointment of some expectations. And this is where uh, he seems to see that the, uh, that the concept of equilibrium, uh, as he has previously used it, has limitations. Because in competition as discovery procedure, he says, quote, a high degree of coincidence of expectations is brought about by the systematic disappointment of some kinds of expectations, end quote. So what is he saying? Equilibrium or equilibration is brought about by disequilibration. It's kind of paradoxical, you know. I have a few other paradoxical statements to make here, and I'm kind of embarrassed by them because it, uh, I, I don't want to be people to go away from this saying that, that Rizzo has developed this sort of Eastern philosophy way of talking. Uh, equilibration is brought about by disequilibration uh, is only the first one I can treat you with. Uh, but it's true. I mean, it is true that the degree of coordination that we, in fact, do enjoy and look, let me keep that open or bracket that in terms of what degree that is. But the degree that we do enjoy is brought about by the systematic disappointment of some expectations, by a certain amount of disequilibration, a certain amount of shocking of the individuals within the system. Okay. So I think this begins to tell us uh, some reason, uh, something about the background to why it's important for a concept of equilibrium uh, that makes room uh, for a concept of equilibrium that is consistent with uh, processes of equilibration be developed. Because if the very process of equilibration, as we generally call it, involves a certain disordering, a certain disequilibration, then it is inconceivable that the equilibrium that could be brought about, the equilibrium as an ideal type that could be brought about, would be a perfect coordination, would be a perfect dovetailing of, uh, of plans. Because the very process that brings about whatever dovetailing uh, that does exist is fraught with uncertainties and shocks and disappointments. Okay. Now remember, the second reason I gave for why we need a looser concept of equilibrium is that we need a concept of equilibrium as a precondition for discovery driven processes. Remember that I said that disequilibrium doesn't have enough structure for there to be learning. Uh, as far as uh, the concept of disequilibrium tells us, uh, it could be totally chaotic. I mean there is no limits placed on what a disequilibrium is, but I think limits have to be placed in order to talk meaningfully about the discovery that takes place in markets. So the learning that we are all concerned about requires then this intermediate degree of structure. Let me talk a little bit about that, what this intermediate degree of structure uh, can be. First, maybe we can begin with the level of the individual. Because I think here it's very commonsensical uh, to see why we need structure in order to learn. Uh, an individual, we know from the philosophy of science, uh, can learn only if certain things are taken for granted or, or treated as given. There's something called the Duhem uh, Quine thesis. And all that really says is that we can never test a single hypothesis, but only sets of hypotheses. In other words, not everything can be tested simultaneously. Everything that we believe can't be tested simultaneously. There's background knowledge. There are auxiliary hypotheses. For example, in the natural scientific context, uh, one auxiliary hypothesis, hypothesis might be uh, a hypothesis or hypotheses about the observational instruments that we use. You know, we're looking up at Jupiter, and we have a, hyp a hypothesis about the rings of Jupiter, right? Or and there are rings of Jupiter now, not only Saturn, but there are rings of Jupiter. Uh, or we might have a hypothesis about the moons of a certain planet. 
and we're testing that hypothesis. But the observations that we use go through this telescope. Well, there are hypotheses about telescopes and whether they show us things that are really there and, and, and the time lapse and various factors like that. So there are auxiliary hypotheses that we have to take for granted in order to test the main hypothesis. There are also initial conditions that we're presupposing. Right? So there are all these factors that we are in a way simultaneously testing. So in order to test any single hypothesis, we have to take a lot of other things uh, for granted. And the things we take for granted are in a way the order that we're presupposing. It's that, it's that set, that knowledge that we take as given that constitutes a context in which continual learning can take place, additional learning can take place. So at the level of the individual, the individual scientist in this case, but you know, we can go beyond science into everyday learning in the sense that in our everyday perception of the world, right, we're taking an awful lot about the world for granted in an attempt to learn some additional or marginal factors. It's very much consistent, I use the word marginal, with the marginalist approach in economics. Right? Uh, small changes are what we're concerned about. So the point that I'm making here is that order is necessary at the level of the individual in order for learning to take place. It's also uh, necessary at the level of society. And here I want to give an example which um, uh, has been uh, discussed by uh, Brian Lowsby in a very important book called uh, Equilibrium and Evolution. Uh, unfortunately, it's a book which uh, did not remain in print very long. But I think it's one of the most important books for people to read uh, in order to get insights as to, the, uh, as to what might be the uh, future development of ideas within the Austrian tradition. Now, Lowsby does not consider himself an Austrian, but I think his ideas are extraordinarily important for Austrians to take account of. And the example that Lowsby gives takes um, off from the dictum that we all recall from Adam Smith. Adam Smith said, as we all know, the division of labor is limited by the extent of the market. And even George Stigler wrote an article with that title. So it's very important. Uh, <laughs> Lowsby uh, uh, says that we could, in effect, says that we could easily read extent of the market as degree of coordination. So we could rewrite this. The division of labor is limited by the degree of coordination of markets. Now, why is that? Well, if you think about it, you know, highly divided labor and specialization can't take place unless there's trade. And trade isn't going to take place if markets are highly discoordinated. In other words, if I can't be sure that I can go out there and buy clothes when I want them, then I'm going to wind up making my own clothes. Same thing with other products. So the degree of coordination is extraordinarily important for the division of labor and specialization to take place. Now, one of the consequences of the division of labor, according to Smith, and the, I guess it's the fourth reason, is it uh, that's generally not paid much attention to is the idea that division of labor promotes increase in technological knowledge. Um, as people concentrate on specific tasks, they learn more about the elements that go into those tasks, and therefore they learn more about the possible ways that Smith, Smith argued of mechanizing the tasks. So that technological developments are more, technological advances are more likely to occur in a context where people have much more precise knowledge of the elements constituting a productive process. Now this has a very, very important implications. Because it, first of all, it immediately throws out a whack the whole idea that the division of labor could be viewed in a purely static context, which is of course a uh, thing which we're often taught in uh, uh, economics that uh, uh, we can talk about the division of labor and still maintain all of these nice, uh, what are called the Marshallian uh, 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 curves uh, that allow for a uh, 
existence of a competitive equilibrium. Now, we also know that Marshall had certain, certain problems with all that. Well, one of the reasons that Marshall had problems with this is because Marshall understood better than the neoclassical descendants of Marshall, uh, Smith's point, right, that the division of knowledge, excuse me, the division of labor leads to an increase in technological knowledge. So there are a couple of things that we need to recognize. We need to know that for knowledge to grow, there must be a certain amount of coordination, both at the individual and the social level. Coordination of ideas at the individual level is most especially what I'm getting at. Uh, at the social level, a certain coordination of individual actions. And that secondly, that this degree of coordination is itself unstable because changes in knowledge that the coordination makes possible constitute changes in the data and are therefore disequilibrating. Okay. So now let me get more specifically to the point, what concept of coordination? I've been vague about that and I'm going to be trying to be more precise, but I don't know how precise I'm going to get because I'm not sure how precise it is in my own mind. Go back to the Hayekian idea of order. Hayek says in Competition as Discovery Procedure, once again, the expectations of transactions to be affected with other members of society and on which all the plans of the several economic subjects are based can be mostly realized. Mostly realized. Now, the interesting thing about this is that he's obviously developing another word other than equilibrium for a concept of equilibrium, for a concept of coordination. Because here, he's trying to separate out the concept of coordination from the concept of order. Because on one hand, he used a concept of coordination as a purely mental construct. In this case, he's using a concept of coordination as what is called an ideal typical construct. That is to say, a construct which is, he believes, as he says later in that same passage, the real world to a certain extent approximates. So being driven by the need, by the recognition that these processes themselves create disorder, he says, well, look, the real world can't look like what my mental construct looked like. That is perfect coordination. The real world is going to look like a world in which, well, most of the time people can affect their plans. Now, he's getting, I'm not saying he has developed an idea which is equivalent to what I'm trying to convey, but what I'm saying to you is that in Hayek there are the roots of this idea of a looser concept. The roots are, were made necessary by his, his concern about describing at least in approximate terms, the real world. In another article called Principles of a Liberal Social Order, he's dealing with the normative issues. Again, an attempt to get at the, the real world, but here in a normative way. And here he gives a, a definition of abstract order, uh, which is very much uh, consistent with the basic theme I'm trying to convey to you. He says that abstract order uh, he says that, uh, that we ought to uh, try to achieve an abstract order which as a whole provides the best chance for any member of society selected at random successfully to use his knowledge for his purposes. For any member of society selected at random successfully to use his knowledge for his purposes. Well, but it's only the best chance. So that means that a lot of people will be frustrated, right? Even in this ideal world of the rule of law, that he advocates. So once again, a concept of imperfect coordination. Now what's unsatisfactory, or at least not entirely satisfactory, about where Hayek goes with all of this, 
is that this is, con this is entirely the concept of order or equilibrium as an end state or a result of some process. But nowhere in the discussion does he provide the kind of basic structure necessary to get the process going. So what I'm saying is that a concept of order that is, that is loose is not only to be conceived of as the end state of a process, but also to be conceived of as a generator of that process. Now, they may not be exactly the same structure. It may not be exactly the same structure or order that, that does both jobs, and we'll get into that in a minute. But nevertheless, I think that's what we're, we're, we've got to be headed for. So let me talk a little bit now uh, about something that I've uh, briefly raised uh, throughout uh, this talk, and that is the idea of the, uh, or at least briefly alluded to, the idea of the scientific research program and learning. Uh, Brian Lowesby, again, makes a, a big deal about this, the importance of the scientific research program. He puts it in a Lakatoshian framework. Uh, what I'll say will follow that a little bit, although I don't think we need to take that all that seriously, because really all he's talking about is this, this structure of learning, which is not completely deterministic. But before we get to the scientific research program, let me talk a little bit about learning uh, in Austrian economics at this point. The major theory about learning that we have in, in the sort of Austrian economics proper, was sort of narrowly conceived, is Kersner's uh, theory of entrepreneurial learning. I suggest that Kersner's theory of entrepreneurial learning is instantaneous learning, and therefore it's out of time. Now, I, am, I, I, I have perceived that for a long time, but just the other day I went into his office. One of the virtues of working with Kersner is you can sort of ask him directly. Uh, and usually he gives you a, a, a straight answer. And he says here, yes, I believe that in entrepreneurial learning is instantaneous. It's a flash of insight. Those of you who have seen him lecture, you notice that sometimes he does sort of snap his finger when he talks about the entrepreneurial alertness and... Uh, so it is, it is instantaneous. The familiar arbitrage examples that he gives illustrate that, right? Apples here at 10 cents, apples there at 5 cents. You arbitrage the difference at a point in time, right? There's no time elapsing. But even the intertemporal exchanges, apples 5 cents today, apples 10 cents tomorrow, even allowing for time preference and all that stuff, there's a difference, and, uh, but the insight that there is this difference, this arbitrage into temporally, is again instantaneous. So learning in Kersner's system has many of the attributes of neoclassical economics, namely it's out of time. And that accounts for the sort of deus ex machina version of, of, of attribute of it, that is, uh, it is a uh, you know, alertness to the rescue, right? Alertness to the rescue of what? Alertness to the rescue of movement toward equilibrium. Well, I don't think that's adequate. Uh, I think what's happened is uh, this view has replaced uh, one error with another error. Uh, the f the uh, Bergson, uh, uh, the philosopher Bergson, makes a distinction between two errors in, in, uh, in dealing with these issues relating to time. The first error is radical mechanism. Now, we Austrians have beat radical mechanism to death. It, as far as Austrian economics is concerned, and that's a big as far as, <laughs> radical mechanism is dead, it can't recover, it's, and that's it. The stake has been driven in the heart, all right? But there's something else called radical finalism. Radical finalism is the view that the end state, uh, implicit, the implicit equilibrium in the current data, sort of exercises a kind of pull on the system. So that at any point in time, there's an implicit equilibrium. And at that point in time, all the adjustments sort of 
pull toward or a pull toward that implicit equilibrium. Right? That's the idea that Kersner has uh, expressed as uh, entrepreneurial alertness is equilibrating, right? meaning that it's drawn toward the data implicit in the equilibrium at that moment in time. That's radical finalism. Now, the reason it's inadequate, from my perspective, is precisely because it ignores the whole problem in, cl in clearly distinguishing or rigidly distinguishing between equilibrating and disequilibrating behavior. Right? By its nature, because competition is a discovery procedure, because we can't predict the results of markets, equilibrium adjustments, so to speak, are shocking. They surprise people, and therefore they're disequilibrating. Hayek says what, equilibra what coordination we do enjoy is the result or is brought about by the disappointment of expectations of some people because they can't predict the results of the market process. So I think the radical finalism ought to be avoided as well as the radical mechanism. The research program helps us to a certain extent because it is a, it is the concept of a research program is an order, but, is an in, but it's an incompletely specified or incompletely determined order. Let me give you a basic idea of what I mean. Um, a research program, and this is consistent with our sort of colloquial understanding of what the words mean. You don't have to be an expert on Lakatos to get this idea. A research program tells us, among other things, you know, what we can and can't do to acquire new knowledge. It gives us the rules of the game. Lakatos calls it the negative and positive heuristics. But it just gives us the rules of the game of acquiring new knowledge. But it doesn't tell us what the new knowledge is going to be. It doesn't determine it. To say there are certain rules of the acquisition of new knowledge doesn't prejudge the outcomes. Otherwise, it wouldn't really involve the growth of knowledge at all. It would just be you know, saying what you already know in different words. So a research program doesn't determine exactly what it will be learned, but pr provides contours, provides certain order provides certain hypotheses which you don't, for the time being, challenge. Uh, it, uh, you know, the hardcore, Lakatos calls it. Uh, I once wrote an article trying to compare Mises with Lakatos in this respect, and probably I wasn't quite right in a number of respects, but nevertheless, uh, there are certain things that we as Austrians, at least for the time being, are not willing to challenge, and maybe will never be willing to challenge, that they're really so basic in our, about our understanding of human beings. But then there are other things we will be willing to challenge. Well, that's the order, that that sort of hierarchy of things that are unchallenged or for the time being unchallenged, things that we do challenge, things that we protect by more elaborate hypotheses, ideas about what we can do uh, in, in the search of knowledge or what we can't do. This provides a, a, an order, but an incompletely specified order. But the learning that occurs in a research program is not only, in that sense, partly orderly and partly surprising, but also in a very basic and important sense, for me anyway, who worries a lot about time, and as I get older, more, even more about time, uh, in a different way. Uh, but it is learning in time. This is learning in real time. It's learning in the extended present. That is, that, that by the extended present, I mean a present which takes account of what we know in the past, memory, and, and takes account of memory, and takes account of anticipation. Memory. A research program's memory, in effect, is the past knowledge, uh, perhaps the hard core of irrefutable propositions, what we're left with by previous investigations. The expectation is the filter the filtering of our new experience that the negative and positive heuristics provide. It's the limits that it sets to our learning. But these limits, as I say, are incompletely determined. So this is a way, I think, of, 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 of grounding learning in real time, not making it a deus ex machina, not making it a sort of you know, spontaneous something to the rescue, uh, but making it grounded in what has gone on before and what we expect to happen in the future, um, and in a way that I think is much more consistent with 
the reality of how people learn, the empirical reality of how people learn. Research programs uh, could be viewed as islands of coordinated learning. Uh, we could talk about firms, for example, as embodying a research program. Uh, Vitt has done work in this respect. Uh, and uh, I don't believe he's used the, the term research program, but nevertheless, I think that's one of the ideas that's embodied in this. Uh, the entrepreneur uh, conveying his sense of the, of the mission of the, of the, of the program uh, to other workers is a critical idea. Uh, the community of scholars and researchers are obviously involved in research programs. Uh, to some lesser extent, we might consider an economic system as having a common uh, a framework to the extent that there is a common framework of law, a common framework of other institutions. Okay. In the final analysis, then, there really are two concepts of coordination that we must use. My talk really should have been titled Better Concepts, plural, of coordination. The first is that of an outcome of the market process, the ideal type, right? People can mostly achieve their, plan, their, their goals, can mostly implement their plans. They are mostly coordinated with those of others. Uh, but mostly leaves a room for a lot of messes. Uh, second is that of a shared mental model or structure of learning. Right? That's also an order, a kind of coordination. But that's one that generates learning and generates the process that leads to this result of we can mostly implement our uh, plans. So the imperfect meshing of plans is the state of affairs, the state of coordination. The research program is the structure or the activity of coordination. Of coordination. The coordinating activity is rooted in something like the research program. And again, I don't want to be, any of us to be hung up on the Lakatoshian framework here, but this is just uh, one way of conceiving it. Let me uh, end up by um, quoting from you uh, from a, um, a book on the natural sciences by, called Science, Order, and Creativity by David Bohm and F. David Peet, uh, 1987. And it's about structure. But when they use the word structure, we can, we can, we can read things like order, coordination, uh, this is the words that we have been using in this talk. He says that they say, structure is often treated as being static and more or less complete in itself. But a much deeper question is that of how this structure originates and grows, how it is sustained, how it is finally dissolved. Structure is basically dynamic and should perhaps be better called structuring while relatively stable products of this process are structures. So structuring creates structures. But even these later, latter structures should not be considered as basically static, for they're the results of processes which sustain them for a time, more or less within certain limits. Right? So the structures are not deterministic, but more or less, just what I was getting at, more or less coordination as a result. As with order, so with structure. There can be compl no complete definition. Rather, to put it again, now this is another one of the Eastern things I'm invoking. Whatever, whenever, whatever we say, whatever we say structure is, it isn't. <laughs> All right. There is always something more than what we say and something different. Well, that's the research program, right? You can't exactly define the research program. Take something that's neoclassical economics. Can you exactly define what it is? The problems that Jerry and I were having, I think, just go to validate our theories. <laughs> How's that for seed, seed, the, seed your views at everything? Um, but, and, but I think it's true, because the research program couldn't give rise to new knowledge unless it were incompletely determined. So, these, so this structure, or this structuring, whenever we say structuring, whatever we say structuring is, is the, word, the way he's using the word structure here is, is in the sense of structuring. Whatever we say structuring is, it isn't. 
There is always something more than what we say and something different. At any given stage, it is possible to abstract a certain structure as relevant and appropriate. But later, as the context is made broader, the limits of validity of this abstraction are seen and new notions developed. A research program, right? As certain limits are seen, you make adjustments. You change what, you, what your goal is. You change your technique. Uh, it happens all the time. You can't, for once and for all, lay down the absolute rules of learning. Otherwise, you never really will learn anything. So structuring has to be incompletely determined. Well, back to what we said. Co the process of coordinating is incompletely determined. So the equilibrium, the order that generates learning is incompletely determined. And what it results in is an order as an end state or an ideal type that is incomplete in the sense that it doesn't work fully uh, because the very process is a messy process involving shocks and disequilibration. So it's really two concepts of order, but I think both are really necessary for us to have a better handle on the issues of spontaneous order uh, that we are all concerned about today. Okay, thank you.